So like you can imagine IBM is deciding whether or not to fire the CEO. Today, that's the IBM board of directors. They do a little vote. Uh, and if enough people vote yes, then the CEO is fired. And if not, it's not. In a futarchy, if IBM were instead organized as a futarchy, people would instead trade what would be the IBM price of IBM stock if you were to fire the CEO? What would be the price of IBM stock if you were to retain the CEO? And if the market says that IBM would be worth, say, $107 if you fire the CEO and $97 if you retain them, then you can use that as information to, uh, or as like a signal to, to fire the CEO. Um, and so that's pretty much what Futurki is. Welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad here with Nomadic from 4RC. Today's show spotlights MetaDAO. In this episode, we cover the world's first decision market platform, including how organizations can use it to create decision markets, how traders can trade those markets, and why this mechanism is so well suited to solve for a world plagued by poor decision making. But before we do, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge podcast possible. Discover Merlin Chain, the cutting edge Bitcoin layer 2, trusted with over $2 billion in total value lock. Merlin revolutionizes Bitcoin by unlocking its true potential with native L1 assets, lightning fast transactions, and ultra low fees on an EVM compatible network. Elevate your Bitcoin experience with Merlin Chain today at MerlinChain.io. Power up your portfolio by borrowing, lending, and multiplying your favorite assets. Made safe and easy by the industry-leading automation tools at Summer.Fi. Summer.Fi offers a curated DeFi experience to access the highest quality protocols and strategies. Discover new earned strategies for your portfolio in a user-friendly app designed to filter based on the tokens you hold, the networks you transact on, the protocols you trust, and the highest available yields. Learn more today at summer.fi, the best place to borrow and earn in DeFi. Tired of hopping between tabs, searching for new tokens before the hype catches on? Try Matcha.xyz, the DEX aggregator from 0x. Matcha connects hundreds of DEXs so you can trade millions of tokens and find fresh new drops. Matcha works out the best route to save you money on every trade. Swaps are free and Matcha has everything you need to trade on-chain. Gasless swaps, limit orders, and cross-chain, all in one place. Search Trade Done at Matcha.xyz. Catch the tide of the mainnet launch of Puffer Finance. Whether you're an Ethereum staker or an aspiring node operator, Puffer delivers the decentralization revolution with its cutting-edge technology. Start with just two ETH to unlock the potential of native liquid restaking and maximize your earnings. Join the movement now and anchor your stake at Puffer.fi. All right, let's introduce the founder of MetaDAO, Profit. Welcome to the Edge Podcast. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on. We're going to talk about, uh, really more about how MetaDAO is going to help in decision-making markets. And so um, hopefully we can break that down today. Like what exactly that means? Where are some like um, really powerful sorts of use cases that we would foresee adopting MetaDAO in the future? And of course, we'd love to cover some of the early adopters that you have on board like uh, Drift. So Profit, maybe we start out with uh, the usual here, just whatever you can share as an anonymous founder about just your background, um, but really would love to get right into the founding of MetaDAO. Sure. Yeah. So before I was Profit, I wrote smart contracts in Ethereum DeFi. Uh, and before that, I was writing caching systems in Web2 and various other software engineering stuff. Um, yeah, so how MetaDAO got started, the origin story was I was working in a DeFi and I came across this YouTube video where, uh, this economist, Robin Hanson, explained this wild idea where you could have markets make all the world's decisions all the way from a small business deciding what geography to expand their product into up to a government deciding what public policies to select or what leaders to elect. Uh, and I've been a long time market nerd. That's what drew me to DeFi in the first place. And it made a lot of sense to me that markets would be better at making decisions than the existing ways of making decisions, right? Like if we see poly market as kind of this truth machine uh, for determining who's, who's winning the election, 
or who's likely to win the election, um, it makes sense that you'd want to use a, a truth machine to make decisions. Um, and so, yeah, pretty much decided then, like, this is what I'm going to work on. Uh, told a few people about it, and they thought I was being silly, but decided to do it anyway. Um, and then, yeah, so started working on MetaDAO, which is the the world's first uh, market governed organization, um, and we're building uh, yeah, infrastructure for for other organizations to make decisions with markets. Yeah, it's it's so cool. I think um, maybe we just start with this term futarchy. Can you break down what that means? And and just I guess so. It's it's Robin Hanson who's kind of been coined as the creator of that. Is that right? Yeah. So Robin invented futarchy in 1999, I believe. Uh, so now 26 years ago, uh, and he coined the word. Um, so like future is in the future and archy as in uh, government. So like government of the future. Um, and yeah, the idea is essentially you make decisions with markets. Um, and so I think it's probably easier to explain in like the corporate example, uh, like the example that people tend to relate to is uh, companies deciding whether or not to fire the CEO. Uh, so like you can imagine IBM is deciding whether or not to fire the CEO today. That's the IBM board of directors. They do a little vote. Uh, and if not people vote, yes, then the CEO is fired. And if not, it's not, um, he's not in a few Turkey. If IBM were instead organized as a few Turkey, people would instead trade. What would be the IBM price of IBM stock? If you were to fire the CEO, what would be the price of IBM stock? If you were to retain the CEO? And if the market says that IBM would be worth, say, $107 if you fire the CEO and $97 if you retain them, then you can use that as information to, uh, or as like a signal to, to fire the CEO. Um, and so that's pretty much what Futurki is, decisions with markets. I know years ago, I, I think this was right when I was getting into DeFi. I, I can't remember like the, the origin exactly, but... I remember I was talking with friends about just different ideas that I thought were really compelling for early crypto, let, let's call it just like Web3 applications. And uh, one of them, it, it kind of crosses over to this. And like, I think what has drawn me into MetaDAO, I was thinking, what if you had a politician who just, you know, swore to its, you know, his or her constituents that they would simply vote on the results of, uh, you know, they would act in the best interest of them by literally voting on every single bill issue, whatever it is based on the results of like a poll. Uh, and, and obviously like this was, I and mean, this was long before I, I really understood what prediction markets were or like what you've built here with a decision-making market. And so I thought just like how powerful would that be if like the person that represents you, whatever that is, whether it's a, you know, a, a president or it's like some like local senator, just depending on where you live in the world, that you are able to weigh in on really crucial votes, knowing that that person was going to abide by the the actual results of that. So anyways, it's it's funny just to like, I, I had this like flashback of, uh, of all of this. And I'm like, okay, yeah, this is making sense. And, and this is, this is why we're where we are today with what you're building with MetaDAO is I think like the infrastructure has caught up with the ability to make this app accessible and usable and, you know, cheap to transact all, all, all the things that I think, you know, once held us back. So why don't we get into more of, you know, the problem that you saw profit in, let's say DeFi, for example, you know, there's all these new protocols that were really powerful launched in just the, the past, you know, four or five years. But the governance around them has been, I think, as messy as the governance that we criticize, like in the legacy world. So maybe you can uh, just elaborate more on like, where you see opportunity for improvement with uh, MetaDAO. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so I guess DeFi in the name is decentralized, uh, which means that you have to have decentralized governance. I guess like my thesis is like if, um, if DeFi is just teams with multi-sigs managing protocols, we may as well just pack up and leave, right? That's you need decentralized governance for this to work. Uh, and yeah, if you look at the existing decentralized governance systems, 
they leave a lot to be desire, desired. So I think Snapshot, for example, recorded uh, participation rates across their uh, votes. And I think the median participation rate in a vote is 10 basis points. So 10 basis points the supply is, is voting on a given proposal. Um, and often when people are voting, they don't really understand what they're voting about. Uh, and so you have all this like DAO theater where essentially people just go along with whatever the team says. And, uh, and that's like how DeFi works today. Um, and yeah, I mean, I view all of those as big problems, uh, with like voting. Essentially people don't vote when they vote, they don't know what they're voting about. And then you have all these DAO theater problems. Profit, could you maybe just differentiate for us, uh, the difference between, I guess, MetaDAO and then the Futarki protocol, like how, how are those two things separate and how do they kind of operate together? Sure. Yeah. So um, the Futarchy protocol is uh, is a protocol that allows you to create market governed organizations. Uh, MetaDAO is the first organization using the Futarchy protocol and uh, or was the first organization because now we have others and uh, is also the primary developer of the Futarchy protocol. And then I think um, I think everybody would kind of benefit from walking through an example, maybe from start to finish, almost like how does a proposal originate? How does it work its way through this kind of decision market process where people are actively trading on an idea? And then ultimately, how does it resolve? Um, and no pressure, but I just saw an article you posted on this Futardio thing. And I thought that was like, just like a really uh, interesting example of how the process played out and kind of also showed the amount of engagement and people that were uh, compelled to trade on this market. So you don't have to use that example if you don't want to, but uh, yeah, maybe just walk us through something so uh, we can kind of map out this process and how, how all the uh, moving pieces work together. Cool. Yeah. So I guess I normally like to start with the Uniswap fee switch as an example of how this works. So yeah, imagine Uniswap is deciding whether or not to turn on the fee switch. Today, people vote with their uni tokens. And if enough uni votes yes, then you turn it on. If not, you don't. Um, in a decision market or a few turkey, uh, what instead happens is, yeah, people trade on what the, what the value of uni would be if you were to turn on the fee switch and what it would be if you were to not turn on the fee switch. So if the market says you would be worth a dollar, if you turn it on in 60 cents, if you don't, then uh, you turn it on. Um, or you can use that as information to turn on. How that works at like a more mechanical level is you have two conditional markets uh, where you're swapping uni. So you have a market where you're trading uni conditional on the fee switch being turned on and a market for uni conditional on the fee switch uh, not being turned on. And so if you buy uni conditional on being turned on, uh, fee switch being turned on market, then you know that trade is only going to be executed if it gets turned on. So yeah, like say uh, the price in the uni, uh, if the switch turned on, gets turned on market is 70 cents. So if I buy in that market, um, I pay 70 cents for every uni. So maybe, um, yeah, I buy like a uh, hundred uni for $70. Then uh, that trade will only be executed if the fee switch is turned on. Um, and so I don't take a risk that like I buy uni because I think it's bullish uh, if this thing happens, but then it doesn't actually happen, which actually happened earlier this year um, where people thought this fee switch was going to get turned on. So they bought and then the fee switch didn't get turned on. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's essentially how it works. You have these two markets where you are executing conditional trades and those trades uh, or those markets have prices and you're looking at the prices of those markets. What we do is we take a time-weighted average price over the whole proposal period. Um, and yeah, the time-weighted average price of uni in the past market or the turn on fee switch market is higher than the time-weighted average price in the fail market, then the Futarchy protocol would automatically turn on the fee switch. Yeah, Profit, I think uh, the first thing that's like popping into my mind is like, who are these users that are uh, being compelled to come and trade on this? Um, I would I would assume there's maybe like a cross section of speculators. There's there's probably groups of people that um, just have like high conviction in the protocol and want to make the best decisions that they can. And 
maybe they're bag holders, maybe they're holding the uni token. But I guess in in your kind of early days of running these few turkeys, like what what does this like cross section of users look like on your end right now? Sure, and to give a sense of the numbers, so we've had around four hundred uh, accounts trade in few turkeys. I don't think anyone has really bought angled or sibling it, so I I think that's probably around four hundred people. Um, and what we see is that in a given market, uh, it's about half uh, people who are participants in a given community. So like with Dean's List, for example, in a Dean's List proposal, I generally see about half of the people trading in that proposal are members of the Dean's List community, as in like holders of the Dean token and part of this like on-chain community um, slash friend group. And uh, about half are... Uh, generalized decision market traders who just trade across all um, all markets. And the motivations of those two different cohorts is slightly different. So with the people who are participants in a community, generally their goal is to have like a good decision or the decision they see as good go through. And so they're actually trying to manipulate the market to go in their favor. And then uh, the generalized decision market traders are just trying to make money. So they're just trying to execute uh, trades at good prices uh, and, uh, yeah, profit by participating in these markets. I think the example you've given with the Uniswap fee switch uh, makes a lot of sense. Whereas I'm wondering, are there examples where you think that, like, this could be misapplied to decision making i'll give like one example might be um let's pretend that we're ave and we're thinking about what collaterals to list and despite the fact that there's there's clearly lots of flawed thinking that's gone into research with certain partners there in terms of which collaterals have been listed but like i'm wondering like how how would you explain this decision making decision making market being applied to something like that where like there is normally like math behind that going into like, should we list this collateral or not? Like is the assumption that just the, the folks that should do their research will do that. And that that will, you know, end up being circulated to the right folks. And that information should get out there and then ultimately be priced into the market. Or am I, um, am I assuming that this, these markets would be more efficient than, than what you would anticipate? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on. I, I think the collateral being added is actually a pretty good use case. There, maybe you wouldn't want to use the price of the Ave token as the as the token in the market. You may want to use uh, like a conditional prediction market on, say, like what's the probability that Ave experiences a blow up uh, in the next three years, and then what's the probability that Ave experiences a blow up if we add this new collateral asset. Um, and and that could either like make the decision or inform the decision. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of like how that actually gets priced in, uh, I think markets have a pretty good track record of uh, being being pretty good at aggregating information. So yeah, like poll for example, with poly market uh, presidential prediction markets have historically beaten pollsters at predicting who's going to win the election. 74% of the time. Uh, a bunch of companies like Google and HP have run internal prediction markets on things like future printer sales in HP's case. And those internal prediction markets have almost always beaten their prior expert forecasts. And then my favorite example is in 1986 when the Challenger space shuttle exploded over Cape Canaveral. Uh, it took the government four months to determine that the root cause of that crash was worn by false O-rings, that those were what caused the blow up. Uh, but the market had priced it into worn by false share price within 60 minutes, as in worn by false shares were trading far below the other government contractors involved in the project. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think like information, uh, like whether collateral is, is good, uh, is, less is is like insufficient is sufficiently non-risky that information i think is like pretty public within d5 uh there are plenty of uh, non-lurkers who know that stuff uh and they would be incentivized to trade in this market uh not because they necessarily want to improve all of it but just because they can make money by trading in the market 
Yeah, that example with the uh, the Challenger space shuttle is nuts. Um, we'll link in our show notes. There's a, a great tweet that I, I think it's pinned on your your Twitter X profile. You know, it just gives all these examples of you know how how and why this should be applied, um, why this would like work in like the physical world, like the world outside of you know the on chain world that we live in. Um, but speaking of uh, like presidential elections. Uh, uh, like sort of like a, a sister application protocol that that's doing really well uh, is Polymarket, and you know Polymarket as of as of this recording, I think has around uh, oh there it is six hundred eighty one million dollars uh, in this market betting on the outcome of whether Donald Trump or Kamala Harris will win. Uh, it's gotten a lot of attention because you know to your point it. I guess obviously the election's not over yet, but it, it tends to react, you know, faster and, and you know, be more of a quote unquote truth machine than uh legacy polls. The those polls, you know, there's no skin in the game. Who whoever is being asked, like, they're not having to put up any sort of money, whereas like to your point, you know, there there's a lot of information that can be surfaced um and then bet on using something like polymarket. So I'm just wondering, like, how do you think about the differences between Polymarket then and MetaDAO? Sure. Um, and yeah, I'm a big fan of Polymarket and prediction markets more generally. I guess the key difference is that, uh, so in a prediction market, you're betting on whether or not something will happen, uh, like will Trump win the election? And in a decision market, like the ones that MetaDAO runs, you're betting on what would essentially be the impact of given action if it were taken um, on some metric, whether that be the price of the token or uh, the riskiness of, or like the probability that Ave blows up. Um, and so yeah, I also think of like the market is, is pretty different. So with a prediction market, you're generally going after um, betters, like speculators, uh, because prediction markets are zero sum. You need to go after people who are uh, net net going to lose money in prediction markets or at least not gain any um, because yeah, every dollar you gain betting in a prediction market is a dollar that someone else loses. The nice thing about decision markets is that um, you can have, you can make the markets positive zone. So organizations get value out of decision-making uh, right? Like in the U S we pay $1.4 trillion a year on managerial salaries. Or globally, we pay $250 billion a year on management consultants. And so there's like a cash value you can attach to decision making and essentially pay the market for, for helping you make these decisions. You know, like, yeah, essentially distributing those to, to people who participate in the market. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think the market is, is pretty different as well. Like uh, in a prediction market, you're going after these speculators. Um, in a decision market, you're primarily going after organizations. And then if you can sell the organizations, uh, my thesis is that like traders tend to show up because uh, traders go where they can make money. And if they can trade, make money by participating in markets, they go there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, those I would say are like the primary differences. It's prediction markets. You're betting on whether or not something will happen in a decision market. You're betting on what would be the impact of a, a decision. And then prediction markets, you're going after speculators, uh, primarily like gamblers, uh, and then in decision market, you're primarily going after organizations. Hey, everyone. Before we get back to the show, excited to tell you about a new Omnichain Bitcoin solution called FBTC, which has already surpassed $125 million in TVL and become the fastest growing BTC Fi asset this summer. The FBTC points campaign Sparkle offers sustainable yields plus points and token airdrops from strategic partners such as Babylon, Mantle's new token Cook, and more. To learn more, visit fbtc.com slash ongoing hyphen campaign. And special thanks to FBTC for sponsoring us at the Edge Podcast. Profit, one more question just on like the process behind decision markets in these, I guess, few turkeys. If are, is a lot of the betting kind of like blind betting, like are you not seeing kind of reasoning behind the bets or is it also coupled with like 
somebody comes in and they make a big bet and they're like, I'm betting this way because, and they kind of articulate a bunch of good reasons. Like say, going back to that collateral example, we talked about at Ave, maybe they're like, look, uh, the WBTC contracts are moving to another uh, provider. We're not so sure about them. Therefore, we think it's unsafe. And maybe they've kind of like diarized a bunch of, you know, concrete reasoning. So I guess my question is ultimately like, like, can uh, it, an influencer with good decision making come in and sway the pack? Uh, and is that information being kind of like unearthed and brought to the public forum? Or is it a lot of blind betting where you're not seeing the reasoning behind the bets? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I think you see a little bit of both. Uh, so there are some people who trade and then um, and then talk about the reason why they trade. It's kind of similar to like how someone will buy a DeFi coin and then post like a, a thesis on it on Twitter um, to get other people to like uh, potentially buy their bags. Um, but uh, so we see that uh, and we also see the opposite, which is like, I mean, I think a lot of traders are pretty quiet. Uh, like there are lots of people in crypto who just don't talk, who just have a Twitter account with like 10 followers and understand everything that's going on. Uh, or like have a, I don't think anyone actually understands everything that's going on, but have a decent grasp, uh, like have a better grasp than a lot of the insiders who work at the DeFi uh, protocols and teams, but just like don't talk. Uh, so actually, yeah, with the we had a recent proposal, um, which was deciding whether or not to build out this product. Um, and, uh, and the primary trader who uh, almost got the proposal to fail uh, wasn't like a, a big whale, but he did, uh, have high conviction in the belief that, uh, sorry, he almost got the proposal passed. He had high conviction that the product would be good for MetaDAO. And so he placed, uh, like a, a pretty, some, some like trades, um, in the fail market. He was selling his tokens in the fail market, essentially expressing the belief, like, I no longer want to hold my tokens if this fails. Uh, and he didn't say really anything in the Discord other than just like, uh, what time does this proposal finish? Um, and I reached out to him and asked him why he was trading this way. And yeah, he had like a pretty uh, re- reasoned way of thinking about it. He said, like, essentially, this is going to drive new users, new DAOs on the platform, which is going to make the, the organization more valuable. And so that's why I'm trading this way. Um, and so, yeah, I think essentially you have a little bit of both. You have some people who are like campaigning uh, for their position and then some people who... Uh, yeah, lurk and then just like trade based on information and don't don't really talk about it. Uh, that's probably a good segue then into more of these like early adopters. Uh, so you've also got uh, Future DAO, Dean's List, and Drift, I-, I believe. So just what else can you share about uh, like what's been the most interesting decision market so far? M- maybe the one you just mentioned is it, but a- anything else you can recall and. Uh, I guess, like, what else have you learned from this early testing? Sure. Um, yeah, I would say uh, the interesting ones are the ones that deal with economics. So Dean's List had a proposal uh, where they wanted to revamp their tokenomics, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and the market passed that one. And uh, MetaDAO had a proposal this February where uh, someone who named Ben Hawkins, who works for the Solana Foundation, uh, he created a proposal to buy a bunch of tokens at a, at a price lower than spot, which was like a bad deal for the DAO, and spent $250,000 trying to manipulate the market in his favor, essentially like bidding the past market to try to get the proposal to pass. Um, and the problem he ran into is every time he would place these like high bids in the past market, say like the spot price was 500 and he was bidding 600, then um, people would be like, oh, I can sell to him right now for 600. And then I think I'll probably be able to buy back in the spot market later for 500. Um, and so I'll sell to him now. I'll essentially like extract money from him. And, uh, and so people would sell into his bids and then the price would fall. Uh, and so the proposal actually failed. Uh, because it's like game played over and over again. Um, and yeah, that was, I thought, like pretty interesting as a testament to manipulation is like actually kind of hard in markets. I mean, the theory behind that is if, if you're manipulating the market, you're a noise trader, you're trading on uh, something other than alpha you have. 
Uh, and in markets, you make money by trading against noise traders. Uh, that was the theory, but like, it was really cool to see that put into practice and people actually like participating in that, even at a small scale. Profit, wh- where would you say you're at in kind of development of this? And I mean, who are some of the other partnerships you're going after? Um, yeah, just kind of w- what can you tell us about kind of the current state of MetaDAO and I guess like where you're going uh, as, as far as kind of expansion? Sure. Yeah. So Futurarchy and decision markets are a new thing uh, they haven't been done before. And like any new thing, especially something that relates to people's money, you have to like build confidence in it uh, in order for it to get adopted. And uh, and so what we're seeing today is like DAOs obviously have these problems with their existing governance, uh, but they also don't want to bet the farm on Futurarchy. They more want to test it out first and like, let, gradually let it expand. This is kind of the position that Drift is in. And uh, and so what Drift has done and, and what we've got interest from from other DAOs to do, Gito uh, just put up a proposal uh, a week or two ago on uh, using Futurki for grants. Um, so using decision markets to decide whether or not someone gets a grant. That's something that a grant committee generally does today uh, and something that I think a market can be well equipped to do. Uh, you can't, I mean, it's, it's hard to run grants decisions on token price because grants don't generally affect token price. And so, uh, what I'm working on right now, what we're working on right now is, is, uh, tooling or like, uh, this system where you can create these custom financial contracts that pay out relative to how effective a grant is. Uh, so yeah, like there'll still be a grants committee. It's just that the grants committee will decide after the grant has been given, say, like three months after how effective the grant was, and then score it from zero to one and say, if the grant committee scores it like a 0.75, then these tokens would pay at 75 cents. And if they scored a 0.9, they'd pay at 90 cents. And, uh, and so you essentially have people betting on like how effective a grant would be deemed if it were given. And if it's above some threshold, like 0.8, then the grant gets given. And, uh, so yeah, that's like what I'm focusing on right now. Uh, what we're focusing on right now is building grants systems to like, uh, allow DAOs to tip, dip their feet in, so to speak, to Futarchy and allow them to get more comfortable, um, and gradually expand. There are so many decision-making markets that are like, just like running through my head right now. I- I'm trying to like write down some of these to either like follow up on afterwards, but, uh, I think about. Uh, teams that are asking that classic question of like which chain, which network should we deploy on? Uh, that that could be so interesting in the future if startups could like use a market like that to decide wh- which, as you know, is it's a big decision. It's it's one that plagues a lot of teams. I think about the Ethereum scaling roadmap or any sort of like major development roadmaps for you know mega blockchain networks. Uh, Th- that would be a really interesting one to me, just given there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of disagreement, right, among you know investors and core developers and and DAP uh, builders. Uh, and then I also think of uh, like take the classic venture model or like a syndicate of angels, whatever, someone that invests or a group of investors, and instead like outsource all the decision making to like a markets model. Someone's going to do it. I, I actually, I'm wondering, has anyone approached you about that yet? Is that something you've, you know, thought about? Like basically, a an on chain venture angel syndicate model that, you know, is is built using you know this this decision making market model. Yes, someone actually is uh, working on this right now. I believe they set up like the the Dow LLC. And are now going through the fundraising process. Uh, I don't want to share too much because it's it's really their project and not mine. And then we, yeah, that goes for a lot of the stuff in the pipeline. Um, there's like a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline that I can't talk about. But uh, what I guess I think I can share is that we're calling it the DAO 2.0, uh, which because that was the idea of the DAO from 2015. It was like you raise a bunch of money and put it in a DAO and then have it decide where it gets allocated. Um, and uh, yeah, this could be, I think this is kind of cool because it's like a reinvigoration of 
of crypto's core values. So what are some of the drawbacks to this model? I think I I I proposed maybe some drawback earlier, but I, I actually think what you called out with like the collateral with Ave that yes, it would work. I mean it should work. Um that information should be surfaced and you know it should, you know, be shared with enough folks that like the market should end up making the the right decision there. Um but I'm I'm curious like where do you see drawbacks here in, in this model? And maybe you can walk us through like if, if there's um more than one of those. Sure. Um well one constraint of markets uh is that they and yeah, this may be an edge case, TBD, uh, but they can't price X risk, like ex- extinction risk, because if the world blows up, no one cares about the price of financial contracts. And so you can happily bet on something, even if you think it'll blow up the world, because you that money is only matters in the case that it, that it doesn't happen. Um, so that's like one constraint that we're aware of. Uh, the others, I mean, there are some others, like maybe you don't want some decisions to be public. I still think you can uh, make, you can still like have markets as an input into the decision, even if the decision isn't completely public. Um, but that's another uh, one. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it takes some time. I, I think it'll take some time for us to figure out like how efficient we can get Utarchy and decision markets to be. Uh, right now, it's kind of this process uh, where you've got to create a proposal and then wait a few days for the market to trade on it and, and have that resolve. Uh, and so you have like this latency of three days for making a decision. And then you have this throughput constraint of like you can't really raise so many proposals at once because the market only has so much attention. Uh, but... That may also just be because the Turkey is new and we may, I, I think we'll probably be able to get that throughput and latency, uh, throughput up and latency down as in increase the number of decisions that can be made at a single time and decrease the latency. Especially if you can get, if we can get AIs trading in these markets, uh, like people setting up their yeah, models to trade, uh, then you could theoretically even have markets finishing in like a few minutes, right? Just because like, those can be on twenty four seven and just trade according to the yeah they're like pre programmed instructions and uh, so yeah I think with that we'll like see where where the constraints are but to definitely X risk is like a, is a real constraint of markets yeah that's really cool I I hadn't even thought of like AI agents trading on these markets and I was actually going to ask you is kind of just um, you know getting up to speed on how to trade these new kind of conditional markets? Like, is that a friction in and of itself? Like, where are the traders coming from? Because I feel like it's new. There's a bit of a learning curve. So I would I would imagine like that in and of itself is like maybe a bit of a friction. Uh, but obviously, yeah, a- AI agents trading on this uh, would, would kind of alleviate some of that. And I believe that's probably something to come. Um, and then what if, what about just... I feel like you kind of spoke to this with that example of the, I think the Solana guy uh, basically trying to game an outcome. But is there any more kind of holes in the system that you see as far as like manipulation or does the market kind of set that straight? Yeah. Um, so yeah, in terms of friction, I agree. Like the friction is really high today. Uh, it's kind of amazing to me that there's anyone trading in these markets at all. Uh because yeah, it, it is pretty confusing. We've gotten better at representing that, but it's still like a long, long way from where I'd like to be in terms of like how simple it is to interact with these markets. Like, for example, one thing that you have to do today is interact with these lower level primitives called conditional tokens, uh, which is how these conditional markets actually work. Uh, but I would like really the traders to just be thinking in terms of conditional trades, uh, like trades that are conditionally executed upon something happening. And so that's like one way thing we can do to improve that in terms of AI agents. Yeah, I agree. Like it makes a lot of sense in theory, at least why AI agents would be better traders than uh, humans, right? They're awake 24 seven. They don't have emotional biases and they can aggregate all the world's information, right? They can read like so much more information than a human can, um, which is all beneficial if you're, if you're trading things. 
Um, and then, sorry, the last question was about what again? Oh yeah, just just as far as like manipulation, you you kind of I think you gave a good example on this, but it, it's like, do you see any other holes in the system or ways for this to be gamed or manipulated in in any way? Um, even by the DAO themselves, like you know, uh, like could could drift. Not that they would, but do they have the ability to decide things in their favor? Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to say manipulation is impossible because it's not. Uh, but I at least think manipulation is, is way harder than in voting systems, right? So like with voting, we have like uh, Hidden Hands and Vodium where you can literally pay people for votes. So like directly manipulate the outcome of a decision. Um, in a market... Uh, yeah, if, if you try to manipulate a market, you're a noise trader. You're trading on something other than alpha and other people make money by trading against you. Uh, and so there's this kind of like natural incentive for, for manipulation to correct itself. We see that in, in markets. Uh, so like flash crashes will occasionally happen because of manipulation. Like someone will try to push the price of a security or an index down. Uh, and once the market realizes this manipulation, it uh, is pretty much always goes back to where it was before because people are like, oh, wait, someone is pushing a price down arbitrarily. That means it's a price. It's, it's time for me to buy. I can buy at a cheaper price. Um, and then that pushes the price back up. We actually had someone in the recent market, um, the recent proposal, they uh, really sold uh, a lot in the past market. And the price went from like, I believe 700 or so in the past market all the way down to 50 because they just sold so much into the liquidity pool. Uh, but the price had gone back to right where it was before uh, within 15 minutes because people are like, oh, wow, I can, I can buy this. Um, and so, yeah, I think like manipulation is not impossible, but it is pretty hard. Uh, and it's harder in markets than in other systems. And the other question was around yeah so like drift uh i think yeah i can actually provide an example here so uh there was a team um that raised a proposal to build a data dashboard for drift um and uh and they were requesting i believe uh 50k in drift tokens to do this and uh the drift team was like theoretically on on board with this so it probably would have passed through a grants uh a grants committee, but uh, the market actually rejected it. The market said this would not be uh, like plus EV for Drift token. Um, and so, yeah, I think markets can be like less uh, potentially influenced by the team than a vote would be. At Moonbeam, we're building a world where the wonders of decentralized technology are accessible to everyone. We're advancing Web3 integration through product enhancements funding for innovation, and investment in our partner ecosystem. Our product roadmap includes ZK initiatives, tokenomics updates, and 8x throughput. Our $10 million innovation fund invests in startups that deliver cutting-edge solutions for RWAs and Web3 gaming. And our partner ecosystem continues to grow through grants and incentives. Moonbeams is delivering frictionless user and builder experiences to create the future of the internet on-chain. Join us by participating in the Moonrise campaign today. Prophet, getting back to, I guess, Robin Hansen, the creator of Futarchy, I think I saw on Twitter somewhere that he actually came and spent some time with you and the team over a weekend. Curious, like, what she thinks of this creation that you've made. Um, like, is he is he curious about it? Uh, and, and like this impl implementation via crypto, just generally, yeah, like, what does he think of all this? And just any insights that he gave you uh, or, or generally how involved is he in this as well? Yeah, so Robin is awesome. Um, we got him to come to this Solana event called Mountain Dow, where I actually am right now in Salt Lake City, which is run by these two guys, uh, Barrett and Edgar, in the Solana ecosystem. And that was awesome. Uh, so yeah, he flew out here from DC and stayed for a weekend, uh, and essentially was just like glued to the whiteboard with, uh, with us trying to like sort out a bunch of mechanism design problems. Um, and uh and was super helpful uh so like one problem that we're trying to solve right now or like working on is the problem of commitment 
So like, if a proposal fails, what are you actually supposed to do as an organization? Like the recent proposal that was a proposal to build a product failed. So does that mean I shouldn't uh, ever raise that proposal again? Or like, what am I allowed to, to do? Um, because if I can just raise again the proposal tomorrow and then it can pass, then there's not really an incentive to price the two markets differently. Uh, like there, there depends, the, the whole thing depends on commitment. Like it depends on if this passes, we do it. And if it doesn't, we don't. Uh, if it's, if it passes, we do it. And if it fails, we also do it. Then the market prices should be the same. Um, and so, yeah, he, he's super helpful on, has been like super helpful. I think he, uh, has gotten somewhat, um, I don't know the right word, but he just told me that like he uh, he came up with this idea 26 years ago, and pretty much no one has done it. And so he's kind of just had to accept like, okay, like people are stupid, like they're not they're not people are stupid in the general sense, but just like okay, people like aren't uh, smart enough to try this idea or too like political. I think that's what he sees as like the major tail or headwind to Futurki is that a lot of the times the people that are adopting these decision markets are the people who like have the least to benefit. So like, for example, does the CEO of IBM really want to create a market on what would be the value of IBM stock if they were fired? Probably not. Um, and so, yeah, I think he's like, caught, I don't want to speak for him, but I would say cautiously optimistic on what we're doing. Profit. I, I want to start to close out the conversation. So, um, before we ask you a final question, I want to remind our listeners that they should uh, learn more by going to first discord.gg slash metadow. It's a great place to get involved in the metadow community. Um, they can go to futurki.metadow.fi and we'll put that into our show notes so you can easily reference it. They should uh, follow metadow project on uh, Twitter or X. And they should follow your handle, which is uh, Meta Profit, cleverly spelled with uh, a three where the E would be. So, Profit, can we close out though with like, what are your thoughts on going permissionless? You know, right now you're in this like early stage of launch, and uh, I recognize there's there's an advantage to deciding like who comes on to this platform and you know what what markets we might see. Um, you know, I, I think it keeps it clean right now. So just what are your thoughts there? And and otherwise, thank you so much for coming on. Just this was like such a fun conversation. And anyways, what, what are your thoughts on going permissionless? Yeah. And I really appreciate you having me on. I think this has been really fun. You guys have asked the, the good questions. Um, yeah. In terms of permissionless and like what are our short term plans? I mean, yeah. So the the core thing right now is making the existing experience really, really good for uh, for the existing DAOs on the platform and like DAOs that are already coming to us. Um, I think like with a lot of Web2 platforms, how they scaled was first get the fire burning really bright, as in like get a really good experience down for the core users and then have it naturally like spread into the adjacent ones. So like if I can get Drift looking really, really good, um, and that's like a really good success case, then it makes it much easier to sell other, other DeFi DAOs on like adopting this. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's like the short term focus is, is really improving the core platform. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I eventually would like to make this more of, uh, almost, almost like a, yeah, a platform in the sense that like, people are building their own businesses on top of this. So like, yeah, I guess future key decision markets are so broad. Uh, so like one specific use case is hiring, for example, you could use decision markets to decide whether or not to hire someone. Um, but I think there's also like a lot of specifics that apply to hiring that don't, for example, apply to grants or to uh, whether or not to like go forward with the product. And I think it can be interesting. I'm not like 100% sold on this yet, but I think it could be interesting to open up the platform for developers to like build their own businesses on top, um, on top of MetaDAO's Futurki protocol. Uh, I'm not sure whether that makes sense yet or not, but I think that could be like an interesting avenue to explore. 
Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod.